It's so good to look out and not just stare at chairs. <laughs> Every beautiful face. Every precious one. Welcome. Um, wow. It, it, I, I may prolong today's celebration because this is it. This is the highlight of our Christian life. This is what we're about. This is why we celebrate. And I just, I'm going to linger. But we have dinner reservations at four, so I'm not pressed. But, um, but God is so good. So good. Um, so, something special is happening here this morning. Um, it didn't start here. It's a continuation. But we're blessed. We attended, um, Elder Jim and I, and Joe and Patty, we, we attended the um, sunrise service down at Smith's Point. Not, not only does light dispel darkness, but it, it does a lot to, to ease the cold. You know, the <laughs> sun comes up and it gets a little warmer. And plus, when you're clapping and kind of moving to some praise music, it gets your circulation going. But with something special is happening this, this morning. Um, past the spot, we left here Friday night, and you challenged us. And it was, um, it, it was something I, I spent a good part of yesterday just pondering, you know, what, what you shared um, Friday night, and it was good. Mama Steve, good to have you with us. Um, you tell him, we're praying. And when he gets it, he owes us some debt of gratitude because <laughs> these two churches, if, if possible, we would smuggle that man out of that place and, and just hold him up here just so you could see him and, and hear him. And Pastor Joni, we're so blessed to have you share Resurrection Sunday with us. Do, do you want to you wanna greet us? Come on. I'm sure, I'm sure you have something to say that we need to hear. It's so good. God bless you. So good to have you. Oh, wait, let me do you one. Right no, thank you. Amen. Praise the Lord. He is risen. Amen. 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 He's alive. He's alive. He lives, right? And because he lives, guess what? We can face tomorrow. Yeah. Amen. So I just bring you greetings from Praying Hands Fellowship. We'll be gathering together again next week. And, um, you know, I just want to encourage everyone at this um, resurrection time. You know, we're, we're all, we all may be going through situations and circumstances, deep valleys, things that seem overwhelming to us, you know, but the resurrection is the reminder. Amen. That there's nothing incomparable to the Lord, even death and the grave. Amen. Amen. So whatever your situation or circumstances that you're going through today, remind yourself as we celebrate this resurrection Sunday, that if he was able to conquer death and the grave, he can conquer anything and everything that's going on in each and every one of our lives. Amen. God bless you. Amen. 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 And it's, it's a lasting thing. You know, Pastor, you shared this morning, and you had a tough audience. <laughs> and you shared, you want to succeed in life? You want, you, you, you want the things that you desire? It only requires two things. Love God and love each other. Okay. And I'm blessed this morning because I don't put somebody else on the spot. George and Kathy. What? what Talk about long-standing relationships. We've been, we were neighbors for 31 years and um, uh, helped each other out uh, more times than, than we can remember. Our kids grew up together. And um, it, it's just a blessing to have you with us this morning. I hope you enjoy the service. I hope, hope you enjoy But it really, it, it means a lot to us. And, George, even as we spoke yesterday, you're a pleasant surprise. I didn't expect to see you this soon. Um, 
But God is good, isn't he? Amen. And, he and he watches over his own. And he takes us through the good times and the tough times, the dark times. Wow. Let me, let me just I'll give you this thought and ponder this. I went through all four Gospels, and I found that a man placed the stone. He rolled it down a rut to cover that grave. But that stone was rolled away by angels, because man couldn't do it. And that stone was not rolled away to let Jesus out of the tomb. It was rolled away that we might look in to an empty tomb and realize that's why it happened. That's what it's all about, the evidence. Now, contrary to the scriptures, soldiers were paid and told, you, we were sleeping and they came and stole his body. The soldiers couldn't move that stone. And we didn't need to roll a stone to let Jesus out. We needed it to let us in. Amen. Amen. Reuben. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Um, before we come running forward with our tithing, <laughs> um, one last moment, if you just give me five minutes. I uh, will put in my heart to share uh, something with you that I've been through um, when I first came to Christ. And the first thing God addressed with me was my fear of death. And I was absolutely terrified of that. I, if I thought about it too long, I actually got anxiety attacks. And he just wanted to show me that for those of us in Christ, that there is no death. And he gave me a dream. And I was in a, a plane flying, a late night flight, two in the morning, whatever it was. Everybody's asleep, the little spotlights here and there. And the plane starts going down. And I'm looking out the window, and if anybody flown at night, it's blacker than black. You can't see nothing. We're over the ocean, so there's no lights or nothing. So it's useless to wait for the moment. So I closed my eyes, and I just waited and waited and waited. And I thought, what's going on? And I opened my eyes, and I was in heaven. There was no impact, no pain, no death. Blink of an eye, flick of a switch, uh, whatever you want to call it. There was no tunnel of light. I just closed my eyes, opened my eyes, and there I was. And from that moment on to this very day, not one ounce of fear even through the pestilence and the war that we're going through right now. I'm just singing and worship every day for that war. So I just thank the Lord myself yes. for, for opening my eyes to that. So thank you for bearing with me. So Jesus, we just come forward to continue our worship with our tithing, to thank you on this glorious day, the greatest day in the history of mankind, for what you've done for us. Amen. Praise Amen. Jesus. just lift this up to you as a blessing and thanks for all you've done all you're doing and all that you're going to do to get us through these times of tribulation that we are in right now let this best go forward to those in need to continue to sow a harvest of it. Amen. Amen. Amen Thank you Jesus Wow um, here's, here's something else um, if you're all done thinking about the stone being rolled away. I wonder 
Have you ever considered the fact that our holidays are being stolen? Christmas, the celebration of the birth of a savior, and it's, it, it, it's all about presents, um, it's all about Santa and reindeer and grandma getting run over. Um, <laughs> you know, what, what happened to the reason for um, our celebration? Easter, the bunny's bigger than Jesus, you know? I mean, it's size. Um, they keep getting bigger. You know, the costumes get bigger. All of that. What, what if, consider this, what if the resurrection is a hoax? What if we've been scammed? And, you know, this really didn't happen. I know, those, those aren't the kind of things you want to think about, but that, that's why I, I pose them and you get annoyed at me. But what if it's all a bunch of hype and it really didn't happen? Well, I thought about it. And I've come, I, I came to this conclusion because I've spent better than half my life in a walk with the Lord. The first, the first half, I was my own master of my own fate, captain of my own ship. It sank. I didn't do too well. But I came to Christ. And if none of this is true, and even if there's no afterlife, my life, walking according to the words in this book, Amen. and a relationship with Jesus, has been so much better than anything I had going for me before under my own. It, it just, the evidence is overwhelming that God went to great lengths to declare his word, to tell us, not, not to, uh, nowhere in the Bible can I read the words warm and fuzzy. You know, he didn't want us to have that warm and fuzzy. Religion gives us warm and fuzzy. Religion says, oh, you're doing good. Isn't that wonderful? Oh, yeah, have another piece of cheese or something. <laughs> you know, um, Jesus said he came that we might have life and have it more abundantly. That means more fully, more, more um, expanded, more all-inclusive, more involving others. It's an awesome, awesome thing. That, that God has designed for us as, as humans. So even, even if it wasn't true, I have benefited because of it. But the real benefits are not temporal. They're not the now benefits. Oh, we enjoy some things now. But the real benefits are eternal. Um, I, I just, I, I wanted to share that because, listen, there are a lot of people who haven't even heard who Jesus is, what he did. Um, do you know that uh, the historical record, there is more historical evidence to prove not only that Jesus lived, but that he had a public ministry, he suffered, he died, he was buried, he rose again, and he ascended into heaven. There's more historical evidence to prove that than there is to prove that Caesar ever existed. You know, we take Caesar for granted. You know, why? Because he do not matter. He's gone. You know, Jesus is still around. And he's still working. And he's still touching lives. And he's still enabling people. And his grace is unlimited. Um, it, it's just, it's, it's amazing. I, I'm, I'm learning new ways to study because... This is like my 27th resurrection service. It's tough to find new material. Nobody's in anything to this book, you know, and if they are, they're in trouble. But how many ways can you say what God has already said in his book? How, ma how many ways can, can we add to it? Um, I, I'm, I'm learning to compare gospel accounts of events, what we celebrate. 
the gospel account of the birth of Jesus, the gospel accounts of the life of Jesus, the miracles, the wonderful things that he did. And I went through the four gospel accounts uh, and, and made notes of uh, first the crucifixion and then the burial. And so let's, we, we left here Friday night um, waiting for the rest of the story. Our Savior, our hope, was dashed. It was crushed. The one we had hoped was going to make the difference. The one who had promised um, to give us this abundant life was nailed to a cross. And we left at, at that point. And, and I, I, I followed this through, and I looked at the burial. And the burial and the resurrection of, of Jesus, I found four different, but not conflicting accounts, just different information. Do you know there are only two people that are mentioned in all four Gospels concerning um, the burial of Jesus? I thought that was really interesting. And none of them were apostles. And none of them were relatives. Well, you know, well, I can't say they weren't blood relatives because we are blood relatives. Because if it wasn't for the blood, you know, I wouldn't give a rip about anybody. But the two people that are mentioned are Joseph of Arimathea, Remember him? He, he had just made, uh, out of a, 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 a rock wall, he had a tomb hewn out. And, and the scriptures tell us that he was a rich man. We also find from the historical record, he was a member of the Sanhedrin, the ruling group of the Jews. He was a wealthy man who had created his own tomb for future use. But he went and asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Imagine that. But, you know, we come to find out he was not just a secret admirer. He was a disciple of Jesus. He was a follower, albeit um, a, a, a closet follower. He didn't want it to be known because he was a man of, of some stature and reputation. Yet, he believed who Jesus was and went and got his body. Now, this isn't in scripture, it's only been rumored. But Pilate said to him, you just, you just had that tomb made for yourself. Why do you want to put this upstart? Why, why do you want to put him in the tomb you, you, you made for your own uh, passing? He looked at Pilate and he said, it's only for the weekend. <laughs> <laughs> but last, last Sunday, when we, when we celebrated Palm Sunday, we, we learned that the donkey that Jesus rode in to Jerusalem on had to be a donkey that was never used before. It never pulled a wagon. It, it never uh, pulled a, a farm instrument. And we look back in the Old Testament, we find out anything that, that was used for a sacred purpose had to be the first time. So that donkey, that, that foal, that uh, um, foal of a, a donkey, that, that colt, had never been used except to bring the Savior into Jerusalem. This tomb had also never been used except to hold the body of Jesus for a very short time. It's interesting how um, the scriptures bear things out. He's mentioned in all four gospels. And in John's gospel, we find out he's teamed up with Nicodemus. Remember him? The guy who came to Jesus at night? Well, Nicodemus was also a ruler, and those two. And it seemed more likely that it would have taken two men to really lower him. Um, from that cross and wrap his body in linen and, and so forth. The other person, surprisingly, the only other person that's mentioned in all four Gospels is Mary Magdalene. 
So we have a secret admirer or a closet Christian, and we have a woman who had seven demons. So, so attached to the Lord because how because of his deliverance of her from from all of that. Now, in between her and this high-ranking guy is the rest of us. So do you think we might be included in this resurrection plan? I, I hope so. I, I really do. Because, listen, I, I, I don't think I was as bad as her, and I certainly haven't <laughs> achieved what he had. So I fit somewhere in the middle. But I'm glad to have access to what Jesus promised. And um, let, let me begin. I'm going to take a little bit um, out of the scriptures. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all declare that um, angels stationed at the tomb rolled away the stone. Um, and, they and, and those angels instructed the women three different ways. Here's what they were told. Go tell his disciples. He is not here. He is risen. Now, in those days, the culture, unlike a uh, liberated situation today, women weren't respected. They were treated as chattel, property. They, you know, they, like children, you know, speak when spoken to. Their, their opinions weren't regarded. But they, they came, they came back to the, to the apostles. They came and gave them that, that news of what had happened. And they didn't want to receive it. So um, let, let, let's look at uh, what Mark tells us. He relates it this way in Mark chapter 16 and verses 9 to 13. Am I in? Yeah, I'm in the right part. Um, now, after he had risen early on the first day of the week, What's the first day? Sunday, because the Sabbath was Saturday. He first appeared to Mary Magdalene, from whom he had cast out seven demons. I didn't just make that up. That's, you know, it's in the Word. She went and reported to those who had been with him. And while they were mourning and weeping, and let me tell you, when you lose somebody close to you, you mourn. We're wired to grieve. Um, we have a hope. But that, that doesn't change the fact. You can believe and, and hold out hope for what God has promised, but you still can hurt in the, in the process. And, and when they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they refused to believe it. Not just they didn't accept it, they refused to believe it. Has anybody ever told you something? You said, I'm, I'm not hearing that. I, I don't want to know that. I don't want anything to do with that. Does that change the reality of it? No, we're just not ready sometimes. We just can't handle that kind of news. How, how many of us have decided to kind of turn the news off or, or limit it? <laughs> I give it 15 minutes and I hope the weather's in there. Yeah. You know, um, it, it just gets worse and worse and worse. And, and, and it, you know, um, it's all in here. We're told about it, um, recognize uh, uh, some of it. After that, he appeared in a different form to two of them while they were walking along their way to the country. And they went away and reported it to the others, but they did not believe them either. So it wasn't just the women that were rejected, but these two others in the country. And that's, that's um, in, in um, Luke's Gospel. Um, in chapter 24. So let me let me tell you about these two folks, um, these two men. It's Resurrection Sunday. It's it's not a, a holy day for the Jews. They they celebrate their Sabbath on Saturday, but before dawn, Jesus is out of that tomb. And um, let me get the right reference. Luke 24, beginning in verse 13. And behold, two of them were going that very day. This is a favorite passage of mine, the road to Emmaus. Um, we're going that very day to a village named Emmaus, which was about seven miles from Jerusalem. 
down. Um, there wasn't a scat bus. There wasn't a trolley. They walk seven, how many of us have walked seven miles? I mean, all at once. I probably have done it over a lifetime, but um, <laughs> never, never all, all at once. Um, and they were talking with each other about all these things which had taken place. And while they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself approached and began traveling with them. Imagine that. He just kind of came alongside and said, hey, guys, what's going on here? But their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. Well, I'm sure he looked a whole lot different. The resurrected Christ in his glorified body looked nothing like the one we saw Friday evening hanging on that tree. And he said to them, what are these words that you're exchanging with one another as you're walking? And they, and, and they stood still looking sad. One of them named Cleopas answered and said to him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem and unaware of the thing? Why were there all the strangers in Jerusalem that were celebrating the Passover? Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem and unaware of the things which have happened here in these days? Do you, do you find that hard to believe? He saved in front row seats. Um, do you find that hard to believe? How many of us have ever said to the Lord, don't you know what's happening? Don't you know what's going on? Don't you know what I'm going through, what I'm facing? You know, these guys aren't so, so far off the mark because they don't recognize him. Jesus is walking with them. He's glorified. He's out of the tomb. He's a new creation, for lack of a, a better description. And he said to them, what things? And they said, the things about Jesus the Nazarene, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word, and word in the sight of God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to the sentence of death and crucified him. Haven't you heard? Don't you watch the news? Don't you know anything? And he just, Jesus just continues with him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, it's the third day since these things happened. By now, everybody should know. And also, some women uh, among us amazed us when they were at the tomb early in the morning and they didn't find his body. They came saying that he had, uh, that they had also seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Now, obviously these gals were emotional and they, and they were hallucinating. Um, was, uh, you know, we could brush them off. Um, some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just exactly as the women also had said. But him, they didn't see. And he said to them, O oh, foolish men and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and to enter into his glory? And then beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, Jesus took a walk through the word. He took them through the scriptures. He explained to them what Isaiah was talking about, what, what happened in Genesis when um, uh, God spoke to Abraham uh, and, and, and told him when the son said, Dad, we got the fire and we got the wood for the sacrifice, but where is the lamb? And he said, my son, God will provide himself a sacrifice. The only one that could restore us to right relationship with the holy God was God himself in the person of his son. We can do all the good works we want. We, we, you can give away everything you've got. Um, it's not going to cut it. You see, salvation is a free gift. You can't earn it. You can't buy it. You can't work for it. You can't trade something. It's just, it's a free gift from God. All you have to do is receive it. He said, um, and they approached the village where they were going, and he acted as though he were going farther. But they urged him, saying, oh, stay with us, for it's getting toward evening, and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. And when he had reclined at the table with them, he took bread and blessed it, and breaking it, he began giving it to them. And then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished in their sight. Wow. 
time. The breaking of bread. We call it communion, we call it the Eucharist. Uh, we call it, you know, the Last Supper, uh, communion. Um, what is it? Well, this table kind of tells it. Jesus' words at the Last Supper, reminding his disciples, he said, whenever you do this, do it in remembrance of me. It's not anything else but a reminder. And it should be a frequent reminder of what he did for us. So he left us with this. So we have something to hold on to, something to grasp, something to look to and say, yes, this is what my Jesus did for me. That's, that's why we celebrate the communion table. That's why we remember the Last Supper. That's why we remember the sacrifice that was made on, on Calvary. Their eyes are open. How often have we been befuddled by something? Confused. Well, um, I believe this because I was taught it. You know? Um, some people question all the miracles, Old Testament and New. They don't just reject Jesus. When Moses, God told Moses to deliver the children of Israel out of Egypt, and he parted the Red Sea. Some say, well, it was this season, and it was really low tide, and there wasn't much water, and so they just, they just slopped across. Nice explanation. But how do guys on horses drown in that much water? You know? You gotta, you gotta read the whole story, and you have to trust God, because he's got something for us. All right. Um, now John gives us his version, and in John chapter 20, um, we'll, we'll read some more about, again, each gospel account, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all give it to us from a different perspective. <coughs> but it's, it's resurrection day, and they're, and they're going to the, to, to the grave, to the tomb. Why, why are these women going? because they had to hurry up and bury Jesus, and, then they, and they couldn't do anything on Saturday the Sabbath, but they were coming back so they could anoint the body and prepare it for a proper burial. Little did they know, he didn't need any preparation. He wasn't staying that long. But we, we find in John, John chapter 20, and verses 1 to 18, now, here we kind of get the whole story, so let me take you back to the beginning. On the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came early to the tomb while it was still dark. Anybody that, that rode out to the beach this morning for the sunrise service, we went out while it was still dark, 5.30 this morning, okay? But we were there, not only to see a sunrise, but to celebrate that the sun had risen. Okay, um, it was still dark. She saw the stone already taken away from the tomb. Um, some of the ladies in one of the other gospel accounts said, oh, here we come, we got all the stuff. Oh, who's going to roll the stone away? How are we going to get in there? Well, it was already done for them. So she ran and came to Simon. Uh, uh, she saw the stone already taken away from the tomb, and she ran and came to Peter, and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved. That's the author of this gospel, John. He doesn't mention his name, but he refers to himself as, as the disciple that Jesus loved. And he said to them, they've taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple went forth, and they were going to the tomb. The two were running together, Peter and John, two old guys. That, that was a race to watch. Um, and the other disciple ran ahead faster than Peter and came to the tomb first. But he stopped. And stooping and looking in, he saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. And so Simon Peter, who came in second, also came following him and entered the tomb. Peter went right in, saw the linen wrappings, linen wrappings lying there and the face cloth which had been on his head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. And I, when you get to be my age, you forget things. I, I had meant to bring like a, uh, a linen napkin. 
what they would do when, when they embalmed the body and buried them, they placed this cloth over the face and then they continued to wrap, wrap the body. It was also a custom. When you were a guest in anybody's home, when you finished your meal, if you just threw the napkin on the table, it was, ah, all right. But if you took that napkin and folded it and placed it wow. by your plate, it meant you enjoyed the meal and you would return. Just wow. a cultural thing. But what significance it has at this point in time, uh, you know, with, with, with Jesus knowing his Jewishness, knowing the, the, the Jewish culture, knowing that people would understand. Another way of saying, you know, I will not leave you helpless. I'll be back. Wow. I will return. That, that's, you know, research will, will, will bear that out. And, and we're, okay, there it is. So the other disciple who had first come to the tomb then also entered, and he saw and believed. John went in, and once Peter went in and wasn't struck dead or something, John followed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture. Now they spent all this time with Jesus, that he must rise again from the dead. He had told them repeatedly at various times what was going to happen. And how many of us listen half-heartedly? Oh, we catch what we like. Oh, but you promised. You said, Mama, you said you said you were going to take me to the movies. You know, that we remember. Taking out the garbage, forgot all about it. <laughs> you know, we had that selective uh, remembrance and, 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 and reasoning. So the disciples went away again to their own homes. John goes home, Peter goes home, scratching their heads. What's happening? You know, it's bad enough we lost him. Now we can't even find his body. But Mary was standing outside the tomb weeping. And so, as she wept, she stooped and looked into the tomb. And she saw two angels. Now, how come, how come they didn't see these angels? I don't know. Well, I, I wondered that. I said, well, did they conceal themselves? Did, were they outside, you know, hiding behind the stone? Um, why, why they show up for her, we don't know. And she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and one at the feet of, I guess, the, the pallet, where the body of Jesus had been lying. And they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. And when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know it was Jesus. Hmm. Didn't know. So far, nobody really knows, you know, because the, the transformation was phenomenal. The glorified Christ, the same one on the Mount of Transfiguration that Peter, James, and John saw with Moses and Elijah, they didn't recognize him. But in all that confusion, it's, it, it's understandable. And she did not know that it was Jesus. And he said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary, she turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabbanai, which means teacher. You know, we used to sing a song at, at Church of Praise. Someday Jesus will call my name. As time goes by, I hope I don't stay the same. There's something about the Lord speaking your name to you. When he calls you, and you hear that still small voice. His focus is just on you. Mm -hmm. And he wants to reveal something to you. He wants to say something to you. It could be a simple word. Peace. Or fear not. Or I've got this. But he knows how to speak to us. 
if we only sit still long enough to listen to the voice and the word of God. Some of us have done very well because we've embraced the fact that it's hard to hit a moving target. So we bob and weave and miss the Lord. And then we blame him. God never talks to me. Well, stand still and let him say something. He does speak to us in this day and age. He may speak through this word. He may speak through the most unlikely individual to come up and tell you something. And listen, why did you have to use him? You know? But God does. He does. If we'll, if we'll just be open to hear that still small voice. Um, and he said to her, Stop clinging to me, for I have yet not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I ascend to my Father and your Father and my God and your God. Hmm. That just, I'll just throw this out to you. Is he your heavenly Father? Jesus is father. Is he, is he your father? He, was, he said, my God and your God. Is he your God? Do you know Jesus? Not only as, as, as Jesus the Christ, and not only as the Son of God, but God the Son, the second person of the Blessed Trinity. We have a triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we're created in his image and likeness. And, and, and I'll repeat this, I think, till God shuts me up. But we are made in the likeness of a holy God. We are spirit, soul, and body. In most of our lives, we operate on two planes, body and soul. It's all about my body. It's all about my soul, my emotions, my mind. Oh, it's all about feelings. But when you come to faith in Christ and your spirit man is made alive, you're a whole new creation, a whole different person with a whole new understanding and a whole new ability to receive what God has for you. Mary Magdalene came announcing to the disciples, I have seen the Lord and that he had said these things to her. Wow, she didn't, she didn't miss a beat. Isn't it interesting? Um, the only two people mentioned in all four gospel accounts. Joseph of Arimathea, a rich man, a man of position, but he was a, he was a uh, quiet Christian. He was committed, but um, he wasn't beating a drum. He, just, he was a closet Christian, if you will. Mm -hmm. Mary Magdalene, having been delivered from seven demons, She'd follow Jesus anyway. She'd walk right into the ocean with him. She knew who he was mm -hmm. and what he had done for her. Um, all right. That's, that's John's um, uh, understanding. And finally, the Apostle Paul has, has a word for us in, um, in 1 Corinthians 15. And yes, we'll be out of here before 4 o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians now I make known Paul the Apostle that probably the man who wrote two thirds of the New Testament now I make known to you brethren the gospel which I preach to you which also you receive in which you also stand wow your faith in the gospel your faith in the word of God your trust in, in, in this biblical account of not only who he is, but what he did and how we can have a relationship, a personal relationship with him. See, I don't just want to know God. I don't just want to know about God. I want to know him in a way um, that he already knows me, but I want to know him. A personal relationship, a personal intimate relationship. He already knows everything about us. We're we to, you know, fix ourselves up and fool him. He knows everything. And yet, you know how a child, um, you ask, you ask the child, how much do you love me? And they go, this much. Good Friday. That's what Jesus did. He said, I love you this much. I stretched his arms and was nailed to a tree. And he paid for every sin of every person 
that ever lived and ever will live. Wipe the slate clean. But it's only ours as we receive it. So here's Paul. He says, I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preach to you, which also you received, in which also you stand, by which also you are saved. You hear that term a lot. Are you saved? Do you know Jesus? Well, what does save mean? There was a time when we saved green stamps, when, when, when we saved bottle caps, when we saved baseball cards. What, what does save mean? Save means being restored to a right relationship with a holy God. If you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believe in vain. Have you ever run into someone who's, uh, you know, and you profess to be a Christian, and they say, oh yeah, I, I tried that Christianity. Uh, that didn't work for me. I said, really, how long did you try it? Two weeks. Something happened. <laughs> Boy, that's, that's a test. You know, um, when you encounter the savior of the world, something does happen. Mm -hmm. Your life is changed. You can accept him, you can reject him. He's not gonna be the big bad wolf and huff and puff and blow your house down. But he will pursue you with a diligence, with a vehemence. He, he doesn't give up. He goes, and he, and he usually, Yes, who he goes after. But if we miss it, it's not his fault. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter, and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. And then he appeared to James, and then to all the apostles. And last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me also. If you know the background of the apostle Paul, he was Saul of Tarsus. He was uh, uh, a man of distinction, he was a Pharisee. Um, he was in the ruling body of the Jews. And he was hell-bent on shutting down this new group of Jews called Christians, the people of the way, the followers of Christ. He just thought that they were um, heretical, and they were wrong, and they misunderstood the scriptures. He was well-versed. Rabbi Saul of Tarsus. And he went out, and he persecuted Christians. And he got them locked up. And on the Damascus Road, with, with uh, the, um, the permission in his hand, the authority to arrest Christians, he's going after them. And he has an encounter. And he's knocked to the ground. And he hears a voice. He says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He said, who are you, Lord? He said, I'm Jesus of Nazareth, whom you're persecuting. And his next question was, what do you want me to do? He was transformed in an instant. Now, I, I, I hope that doesn't happen to us. If something like that happened, I'd be gone. And, and that'd be the end of it. I, I like a, a tender approach, subtle, <laughs> nice and easy. Um, let's, let's talk about this over coffee. You know, um, but so, you know, he needed to be stopped dead in his tracks. And he was. And he became the Apostle Paul and he wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. And he, and, he, and much of it he, he did from a prison cell. He knew who Jesus was. You didn't have to convince him. And you weren't going to shake his faith. Amazing. And he got stoned. He got left for dead, thrown over, you know, out of a city, shipwrecked how many times, beaten, whatever. He, he paid a price for his faith. And we don't want to go to church because it's raining. So, and last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me also. For I am the least of the apostles and not fit to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. And yet God, God took him 
changed his life. And he became such an awesome advocate of Christianity. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. By the grace of God, any of us are what we are. So, let me ask you. Jesus, when he came out of that tomb, he defeated hell, death, and the grave. How, how do you defeat an enemy? You know the best way? <coughs> Is to make him a friend. Mm -hmm. You got somebody that really irritates you? Somebody you really want to put down? Put them down on your prayer list. Mm -hmm. When you start praying for people, all of a sudden your attitude changes. They don't change. You change. Because you begin to perceive them as God sees them. But they're mean to me. But I don't, you know, they always take advantage of me. Or they're always making fun of me. Or they stole from me. Or, or they, you know, whatever the case, you begin to pray for them. And watch how God changes your attitude. He is risen. Christ has come out of the tomb. He paid the price fully and completely. You and I cannot add anything to God's gift to us. We can only receive it and embrace it. And then walk with it. Live it. Christianity is not a denomination. It's a lifestyle. It's walking. It's inviting. Jesus Here's what happened. Forty days later, Jesus gathers his disciples. He says, guys, it's time for me to go. My mission is accomplished. I, I hung around so that nobody would, would be able to doubt that I, I survived and I came through this and I accomplished it. He says, but I will not leave you nor forsake you, and I won't leave you helpless. I'm, gonna, I'm going to my Father and I'm asking him to send the Holy Spirit who will be with you and in you. The believer has an indwelling Holy Spirit. We already had a conscience. How's that working for you? Okay? We try and, 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 and sublimate it. Um, but the Holy Spirit guides us, instructs us, helps us understand this word, opens it, opens it up so that it makes sense to us. That's the, that's the relationship. We're only here for a short time. You know, they used to live 900 years. That went by like a blink of an eye. But we're going to spend an eternity somewhere. And I strongly suggest you make your reservations now. All that's required is recognizing this book is true, that God is true, that God had a plan. It says before the foundations of the earth, before Adam and Eve ever messed up in the garden and had to cover themselves with fig leaves, but then God came along and he said, that ain't gonna work. And he sacrificed an animal and he put skins, animal skins on them to cover their nakedness. Jesus has covered our nakedness. And he's done it by surrendering himself. Mm -hmm. But he has emerged victorious. Not only is he, has he risen, but he is sovereign. He rules and reigns in the hearts of those who have opened up to him. So let's stand. We'll close in prayer. And um, I, I, I want to give you an invitation this morning. Because I might not see you till next Easter. Mm -hmm. And Hopefully you will hear this message again and again and again, that God loves you, that God has a plan for your life, that God wants um, to really receive you unto himself. It's not about sacraments. It's not about pledges. It's not about writing a check. It's about opening your heart. Opening your heart. We know, we know God is real. And now he's revealed his plan. It's up to you and I. You see, the love of God caused, caused him to give us a free will. 
We can say, yes, Lord. We can say, no, Lord. We can say, not now. But you can't say, no, Lord, because that's an oxymoron. If you say, no, he's not Lord. Mm. But just consider for a moment. Father, you have given us the greatest gift mankind has ever had opportunity to receive. Jesus, what you did was so real. We see it in the movies. We read about it in your word. We're told about it in church. But do we really get it? Are we like the, uh, the early disciples? They just wouldn't believe you rose from the dead. They wouldn't believe you had come out of that tomb. They weren't even sure that, that they were checking in the right place. But Lord, it's all been demonstrated. History bears it out. The Bible bears it out. It's available. It's, it's there for us to examine. I pray, Father, this morning that no one would leave here not considering the possibility of a relationship with you. Lord, your word says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Every one of us. No problem. We recognize we're sinners. But we need a Savior one who forgives us, one who strengthens us, one who will come and live within us and guide us through life and all the choices that await us. Father, I pray, I pray that you would move on hearts this morning and that people would embrace Christ, not a church, not a theology, not a denomination, but a person, a living, true individual who paid a great price to purchase our freedom and our salvation. And I'll, I'll be happy, my wife and I will be happy to wait here, to pray with any of you, to talk to you more about it, um, to encourage you. But I declare this, he is risen and he has forgiven each and every one of us. All we have to do is receive what he offers. Father, I thank you in Jesus' precious name. I pray a blessing upon everyone gathered here. And I thank you, Lord, for the churches represented. I thank you for Praying Hands Fellowship, for Rushing Wind Biker Church. We especially, Lord, keep past the ski in our prayers for a speedy recovery and a complete recovery. And Lord God, we can't wait to have him back. We sure do miss him. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' precious name. Amen. 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 Have a blessed Resurrection Day. Happy Easter, whatever, whatever you want to call it. But um, God's still on the throne, and he's done some awesome things. Amen.